Hello, my fellow YouTubers. This is Roy back again. I'll be back in a minute. Hey, Adam. Welcome aboard. You're going to love tonight's discussions. Just to give you a little, little hindsight, we're um, Schumann residents. Also, wire gauges. Also, length of wire. And also, the ohms and resistance of the length of wire. I'll be back in a minute, Adam. Let's get some people aboard here. They're going to love this. going on Jason got Jason in the house got Adam in the house guys are leaving some great comments by the way I'm digging in deep man just using the comments and just going with gut feeling I'm just getting into it's a lot of reading all right Let's go ahead and get to it. So, um, let's start off with Did I see what? No, I missed it, Adam. What did what'd you ask? All right, so we're going to start off with this. So right now I'm working on uh, I'm working on the windings for the for the magnets, okay? And what I want to do with the windings is um, one, uh, I don't want to have too much resistance, but two, I want I want the what I'm calling low voltage, 40 volts, um, to not get lost in the sauce in a way. So um, I'm digging into the wire sizes and the length of wire and how much resistance. And uh, let's uh, start off with, with winding these, okay? So just the length I have here, I can most likely get in 25 turns. All right, and Mr. Adam says impedance. 25 turns, okay? So um, I'm looking at the width here and then the length. And um, so we're going to have, say, 4 inches, 4 inches, 5, 6 inches. 4 and 4 is 8, 9, 10 inches. So we're going to calculate 10 inches per turn. So um, I can go 10 high, 25 wide. That's 250 turns. So that gives me an idea. I said, all right, so let's start off here. What's up, William in the house? Let's start off here with wire gauges, and we're going to get into resistance of the wire by length. So here it's saying there's um, um, per thousand... Let me see. Per thousand feet in ohms resistance and basically what diameter. So let's start off here. Uh, let's start off with the PMH. But then we'll go to the we'll go to these. PMH right now is a foot all the way around. Okay? So every turn's a foot. So there's fifteen hundred turns that I wound on the PMH, okay? So it's fifteen hundred. So if you go to here and say we got 22 gauge wire, and I already know how many ohms are on it from testing it, and um, it's pretty damn close, if not accurate, because 22 gauge wire, this is a thousand feet. I got 1500. So do so uh, it would be um, 
1,000 feet plus half. So half of 16 is 8. So it would be like 24 ohms. On my voltmeter comes up 19 ohms. So there is a difference there. But you can see that uh, at least we have some numbers to figure out how many ohms. So then we can go to the, um, the, mag the magnet wire wrappings and we can say, okay, what, what am I looking to do? Well, I want to get more turns on here. I want some resistance. Now, they're going on every single one. So think about that. There's 24 magnets. So whatever I'm doing here would be 250 turns, okay? And that would be per spool times 24. So let's go to the calculator. So the calculator, we're going to say 24. Uh, I can barely read it. I don't know if you guys can. 24 and uh, times 250. So... Enter, we're at 600 turns. No, 250 times 24. That's wrong. Let's clear that out. 24 times 250. 6,000. So it's 6,000 turns. So that will be 6,000 times 10 inches. It's not 12 inches. 10 inches. So I'm not even going to get into that with this calculator, but that'll tell us how much resistance. So let's, let's go there. Might as well, right? So we got 6,000 and we're going to, we're going to 6,000, say if it was one foot, uh, be 6,000 feet. So per thousand. So the resistance is going to be a 22 gauge wire would be 16 times 16 point, 16 point one four times what did I say 6,000 times six. So we're looking at 96 ohms. Too much resistance. So I, I think what we're going to do is wrap that with 16-gauge wire. Uh, all right, so why would I do that? To knock down the resistance. But I don't know if I can fit that much resistance wire or that much 16-gauge uh, wire. So we got a problem, right, guys? So remember in my video I did last, last night or the night before in regards to the resistance? that if we went with 16 gauge wire and went down, um, it will take a lot more um, power to run them. So it, we would need resistance in that. All right, let's go back to the chart again. Now you're gonna love this. This gets even better because this chart, I got another chart we're gonna get into that takes it an another level. So let's just go here and just kind of determine what the best gauge wire and, and why do we want a lot of turns with some resistance? Not too much. We're, we're not going to have too much current going through this. So resistance on that current really is not a main factor here. I think it's more about getting a um, large B field and by creating the B field, you'd have to have a strong magnet. And that's where a magnet opposes coil. When this gets stronger based on what this is generating with a multiplier, so we're going to supercharge it and throw in a cap and then dump it back into here. So this, we want this to get strong magnetism. So this side is creating the stronger power or uh, stronger um the negative charge particles, we'll call it. So we'll go back to the chart here. So if if we went with, say, 20-gauge wire, 
See, 18 is, uh, 16 is pretty thick. 18, 20. I'm thinking 20 might be the number. So we would have 10 ohms per 1,000. So we would have 60 ohms. That's still a lot of resistance. Still a lot of resistance. That's natural built-in resistance. I think that's too much. Damn it. Then go to 18. We're drop down to 6. So 6 point. 6 times 6 is 36 ohms. Not so bad at 18. Right? Then you go to 6 times 4. 24. Wait a minute. 24. 16. 24. Is this what Ed's talking about? Sweet 16? Where you have 16 gauge wire going on 24 poles. It puts each pole at 1 ohms. Leave your comments. At 1 ohm each. I think we're going to roll with that. I think there, that just determined... Sorry about that. That, that just determined... 16 gauge wire with one ohm each makes sense. It matches the 24. We're going to go with that. All right, let's move on. So this is going to be good. You guys ready for this? So we're going to talk about notes, okay? And then we're going to go to the note, and we're going to look for frequencies, okay? And then we're going to look at wavelengths. And the, remember now, the wavelengths are in centimeters. All my ham friends out there, uh, you ham, ham manics, uh, ham radio, everything's in centimeters. So there you go. So I went through some of this. Just kind of get the – I went through some of this after – going through this first. So let's go through this first. There's some notes I wrote. Ready? Schumann resonance in Earth's atmosphere, we'll call SR, Schumann resonance, are a set of spectrum peaks in the Earth's electromagnetic field spectrum. Now, stop right there. That excites me because that means there's a couple fields going on and the field peak. So you're going to have a peak and then it's going to come down as a low and, and hug the, 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 the planet tight and then come back up as a peak. So you got a peak. Now, exciting about that is there's three different peaks. So if you go down to here, this is a loose chart, but this is, I would say, the side face in the sun. That everything's flat against the planet it would be my take. I'm not 100% sure, but this is what I'm thinking. This here are the peaks. And the peaks go from top to bottom and just stick out in different places, which we'll get into that when I can draw that better. But for right now, that would be peaks. So that means through the whole damn planet, there's a wave running. I want to ride that wave. So that's where this all comes in. So we're going to go back to Schumann resonance, our global electromagnetic resonance generated and excited. And oh my God, when he, I get excited just hearing that. And excited by lightning discharges in the cavity formed by the Earth's surface and ionosphere. What we have is three different nodes. These are the frequency of the nodes. So we're ranging from 20.3 hertz down to 7.83 hertz. So I come over to this chart over here and I said, let's see what frequency, let's see what in music, what note is it going? So I come over here and I find 20.60. And I believe that matches this 20.60. 3 hertz and it's an e i guess o is octave e octave wave of length wavelength 1674.62 when you go through all the centimeters and figuring out 2.54 is an inch 
to come up with 54.9, almost 55 feet of wire. I like that, Jason. I like that. I didn't read it all because it comes up on my screen and disappears. But I like that. Keep feeding them. I go back and watch the video and, and soak in what you're saying. So 55 feet of wire as a coil brings us to that frequency in hertz. If I build this in a residence of what we're talking about over here and pulse the ground and the air, like I'm talking about with the pipe, the, the above the pipe for air and below the pipe in the ground with this, everything tuned in to that frequency of E octave, which is 20.60 frequency in hertz the wheel speed of the wheel i'm gonna have to once i build the and the coils and figure out exactly how many turns each coil is going to get of 16 gauge wire to reach one ohm per magnet so we'll we'll get into the so the harmonic would be 27.83. Where do you get that from? Where do I have to look that up? The harmonic. So, let me see what else. So I get excited over here with my Tesla stuff in the AM band because usually I'm building coils in the anywhere between 500 on my wider coils, 600, well, this is in hertz, so that ain't going to be my... Yeah, that's, that's in hertz. I'm thinking kilohertz. No. So that's not even Tesla. That's way too slow. Everything's way too slow. So anyway, so that brings us back to the magnets. So I'm going to go ahead and use 16-gauge wire. I'm going to try to achieve one ohm per. Um, they're going to be aluminum spools. Electromagnetic field. ELF. It's exactly. It's exactly, Adam. The ELF. So, one ohm each, not a lot of resistance. We're going to, this time, do it differently. I'm going to set these up in pairs instead of every single one being um, north, south, north, south. It's going to be set up in pairs. So, the pair gets charged like in proper timing. So like the switch, when these are halfway from the approach, approaching magnet is when they switch. It goes by, then it switches again to reverse in the poles. So there's going to be a capacitor and maybe just a little bit of resistant wire if I need more resistance, if I can't get the power up enough to give me a strong magnetic field. And I think that's probably probably going to be my throttle. I think uh, a variable resistor. Now, we're dealing in pulse. We're dealing AC waves here. So I, I don't really think the resistance is going to be a factor here because we're not going to have a lot of current. But what we are trying to do is, is slow down uh, and create a pressure, which will be in the capacitor plates, right? So there's your pressure. So let's start the process here. So this as the um, frequency, the pulse, okay, goes into this, which is the beat. This beat here sends out and goes to the capacitor plate. 
and the capacitor plate gets uh, filled constantly from the rotating. That's kind of like the first uh, circuit, circuit thing going. And then from there, you're going to another capacitor because this capacitor will never dump. This will keep charging. Sort of like your, if you have wells, you have a, a pressure tank. That one will be the pressure tank, okay? And that is going to bleed off into a smaller capacitor, which will be the pressure, which will be a mini pressure tank that dumps. It dumps the whole, the whole thing. And when it dumps, it's um, tied to these coils, which would be the inductor, and then the capacitor plate. So you'll have your tank circuit there. So when this is charging, uh, that is discharging. When that's discharging, uh, uh, when that's discharging, this is charging. When this is discharging, that's charging. So there's your tank circuit. So uh, this is going to be cool as shit, guys. I hope you appreciate it. Um, I got the heat still on. It dropped the temperature pretty good over here. Uh, there, It's dry. Um, I'm still checking it for continuity, and the continuity between the magnets and the frame went away. It was just beeping, just faintly. I think it's because the concrete was wet. So I've been getting that um, dried off when I get home. Um, right now, I'm going to go ahead and dig in to start making coils. I got it pretty much figured out. I, I think the Schumann wave is if we have, uh, follow me here. If I got um, a, a dielectric and a pair of plates on both sides of my finger, and I got another set that's in proximity to a, Whatever the dielectric field is on the inner plate, the gap here will supersede so they don't connect, okay? But there will be a, a sheet of dielectric in between them, okay? Sort of like a one to third piece of dielectric. That dielectric will go around to a framework that goes around that, and that's a dielectric field. That field would be the, um, would be the, uh, uh, the coupling... I would call it a loose coupling, a coupling to the earth. So whatever earth is around it, it'll be a electrostatic uh, inherent connection or coupling. So that's your outer layer of what's in the ground underneath the wheel on, under each, each pole. Now you'll have a set of, of inductors with a dielectric and a set of, of inductors with dielectric. And what you'll have is the... Plates will be moving the charge. The dielectric will be holding the charge. The plates will be rotating with the plate above it, okay? And these two will be creating a dipole like this, okay? Doing a vertical dipole. It's very important. It's a vertical dipole. Now, remember, this vertical dipole is going on. Look what's in front of me, all right? We'll get into that. Not right now, but look... Vertical dipole going. Look what's in front of it. Now, vertical dipole between upper two plates, bottom two plates. Now, what you also will have is the same thing, but going out of phase on the other side. So what we're going to do is create two dipoles, but the two dipoles, one dipole is always chasing the other dipole's pole. So they're always at opposite itself. So whatever's coming towards each other, sort of, I want you to close your eyes and think of it this way, sort of like a Wimshurst machine that is going in the ground and into the air, but we're creating that electrostatically in these plates that, I'm, that I have in my head that I'm telling you guys that what I'm going to build and put in the ground. Because I know with enough charge on it, it... it how, you're probably saying, how are you going to get that much charge? It ain't through my electromagnetics right away. Um, it's, it's, this is the start, the function to get it turning. And then either I'm going to bleed off of some of these or put more coils around it to create my voltage. And then I'll step the voltage up and then I'll start putting it into a flyback, which don't need more than 12 to 24 volts. I already have that, which just with the two PMHs. But these would be what keeps the thing turning. So now I would have the flyback 
introducing high voltage into the capacitor plates. Now, the capacitor plates is getting fed the uh, negative charge into the plates, which is making the plates. One thing I want to do is create a pressure. So what's in the ground and what's up above in the air, a lot of pressure. So I'm going to have to use a thin dielectric. It's all about building up that pressure. Sorry about kicking the thing. Uh, it's all about building up the pressure. How are you going to do it? And I'm showing you step by step how I see what we're doing here is this is what I'm telling you is that it's bagging off of this, going into that, going out of that, going into a capacitor plate out of this, and then going and separating probably another circuit, which will be a multiplier into a flyback into, into the capacitor plates. So it'll go through another circuitry before it hits the capacitor plates coming out of, out of here. But I'm getting 40 volts, uh, a little bit more. But once I put a load on it, I showed you guys, it drops down. So I, I know I'm getting a constant 8 to 12 good current volts, which I haven't checked the current on it. But that'd be a video I do next time. Um, I hope I covered everything for you guys tonight. So next time I do a video... Yeah, Adam, glass, glass of, uh, um, yeah, yeah, it's just something that's going to, that's going to give me a, like, like Tesla always said that the slack spring capacitors was the thick dielectric and the, uh, the thin dielectric was always the snappier, um, snap he called it so when you're doing it with tesla energy you're you know you're sna you want that snap it's that rate of change and um i think that's with us in the ground with the dielectrics um uh, plates doing this dipole which is creating a, a vertical dipole and then you're going to be having this dipole horizontally because the two upper plates and two bottom plates are flopping dipoles underneath there. So they're going to be having a vortex plus a vertical going on. So there's going to be an updraft, I would almost call it, something like that. If you think about tornadoes, how they run, um, how the energy is being formed in the ground and above the ground in, in, the, in the upper parts of the pipe. Now, remember, the pipe's not going to be connected to anything. It's just uh, they're the part of the PMH, one, to hold it, and two is to have a lot more iron in the PMH on this side versus the iron that we're trying to balance the iron that's on the PMHs versus all the iron that's on the wheel. Sort of a, a little balancing act going there. But uh, I think I got it covered. So next time I do a video, I'll have all the spools up. Um, we'll get it back to going uh, uh, to where it's perpetual again on its own. And I think at this time, we'll have control based on how much resistance I add to it or deduct the resistance. Um, uh, guys, leave your comments. Thank you very much.